All right. Lab today. We'll look at these flagellates. Uh, we have some presentations today. So if you're presenting, make sure you get me your presentation. And I got yours. So. We'll see what happens this week. All right. Any questions? All right, left off with new phylum, Parabasalia. All right, they've got a uh, few new structures, Parabasal bosi, which is the Golgi, the axostyle, the stout median rod. We can see that. They have these hydrogenosomes, which you really can't see in our images. Um, you're going to see flagella on these things, um, just like we, we saw with uh, the Retorta monata, Giardia. All right, so the group that we're interested in are the trichomonads. Uh, they've got all of these structures. Again, it's pretty obvious with what they have. Uh, and the diagram's pretty darn close. Uh, let's see here. Let's add to a new window. I mean, you're going to see these. We have some slides that were prepared for us. Uh, prepared for us from pigeons, so you can kind of make out. It's not the best. It looks better when you can actually get it in focus really good. But you can make out your flagella, current flagella, your axis style, um, guys, your nucleus. Pretty darn obvious. Um, stains dark. It doesn't always have to be um, circular. It can be more football shaped, but they all basically look the same. Depending on their position, you can make out the undulating membrane. So uh, we'll look at them. Are they very small? No. Uh, you, for these, you can get by with 40x uh, to zoom in to, to take a look at it. Uh, and we said, we left off and said we have basically three species that are important to us. Trichomonas vaginalis, we have Trichomonas scalinae, and Trichomonas tenax. All right, and they differ on their hosts. These two are humans, uh, Trichomonas gallinae and in, in the birds. So what we're going to do is going to go over the life cycle, and the one thing that you'll get is my cursor. Where's my picture? There it is. The one thing you'll see is that for this one, we do not have an actual diagram. It's like the only time we don't have a diagram, and it's because it's direct transmission. It's direct transmission of our trophozoite. There's basically just one stage, a trophozoite, and you transmit that trophozoite to other hosts. So really, there's no diagram that's needed. All right, so yeah, trophozoites are the only life cycle stage. That's all we see. And that's the image that we just put up. That is a trophozoite. That's our feeding stage. Uh, it's transfer directly, all right, and replication is binary fission. We call it longitudinal fission because it starts at, at the, uh, it divides along the longitudinal axis. Now what we're going to do is talk about each of the individual species, each of those three species. Uh, we have prepared slides of Trichomonas vaginalis, and we have prepared slides of tr Trichomonas gallinae. We do not have it for 10x. But that's okay because, as you'll see, basically once you see one of these trichomonas, uh, you've basically seen them all, at least in terms of identifying the major structures. All right, so starting off with trichomonas vaginalis. This is infecting our human. Uh, it infects our human. It is in the reproductive tract of humans. It exhibits horizontal transmission, so transmission from one individual to another individual. All right, so horizontal is not the parent offspring transmission. It's from one to another, and it could you could say it could be from parent offspring, but that is vertical transmission where you go from parent to offspring. 
So at least when you talk about horizontal transmission, it is from one individual to the other. How it happens could be through uh, sexual inter intercourse, because we are, this parasite is in the reproductive tract. It's in uh, usually the vagina, but then in, on the male side, you're, you're dealing with the urethra uh, and, and so forth. All right, so sexual intercourse could go male-female transmission, uh, but you also have contact through soiled washcloths, towels, undergarments, and, and so forth. So don't share underwear. Don't share towels. I think it kind of makes a bit of sense. Okay. Wash the towels beforehand and so forth. That's how you get to transmit it. Uh, there is some vertical transmission. Right, and this is parent to offspring. And what we're talking about with parent to offspring is this part where you have a newborn infant that exhibits <laughs> trichomonas and is infected with trichomonas. So it's exhibiting trichomoniasis, and that's, that's the, the disease, and it has this trichomonas. And you think about it, and you say, well, how could a newborn get it? Well, it's less common, but it's possible that the mother was infected with trichomonas, and then as she was giving birth, you had some transfer over to that newborn, and that's how they, they became infected. What's noticeable and, and rather interesting is that you have, you have changes in the environment that's induced by the parasite. So the, uh, the vagina is actually a pretty harsh environment for trichomonas. They can live there, but it's harsh for them. So one thing that they do is once they start to infect, they change the pH and make it a little, little bit higher which makes it more conducive to their life, to their replication and uh, favorable for growth. So it's not necessarily, you, you can probably say maybe this could be considered a uh, adaptation for transmission, but yeah, is it, since we're not really transmitting, so we're only transmitting directly, this is more about altering its environment to make it more favorable for them. And they, they, they can do that. And that kind of lead, can lead to some uh, of the pathology that we see with this. Ready? All right. Whoops. Yep. All right. Trichomonas gallinae. We're still under like our life cycles and, and so forth. So horizontal transmission. Uh, this is in our, in our birds, so horizontal transmission would be from one individual to the next. Uh, this all can occur through uh, drinking water. So that's part of why Dr. Skipper's student went out and looked, is that if you have this in a bird and they visit a, uh, a bird bath, you know, that's a common shared water, watering hole. Uh, and the idea was that once you come into more of an urban type setting or suburban type setting, you're having more of these shared water sources, which could increase transmission uh, and the spread of Trichomonas gallinae among these bird populations. So we know it goes to the drinking water, that drinking water uh, could infect other individuals. The other thing, the other way in which you could transmit is if you have a bird of prey species, take down one of these infected prey items or Again, you have like a, a forage bird, eat it, and then become infected. Now, it's going to have to be a recent death for the forage because once the bird dies, it no longer becomes a conducive environment and that trichomonas will ultimately, ultimately die. How long will it take? I don't know, let's say 24 hours. Maybe you have a 24 hour for the forage bird to, to get it. Uh, vertical transmission could occur, but since we're in birds, the the way you would get that vertical transmission is the parent bird's infected, they get some food, they regurgitate it into the mouth, and thus transfer your trichomonas. Because in these guys, in trichomonas gallinae, we're not in the reproductive tract. We are in the throat, throat region, re respiratory tract, throat respiratory tract. We'll see some images of the pathology. Ready? Next one. Uh, 
Well, trichomonas, I don't have trichomonas 10x. It's in the mouth of humans. How do you think those things transmit? Take a guess. For humans? Yeah, sharing, sharing, drinking, swapping spit, get, take it for what it is. So, uh, again, I don't think we're, we're, I don't have much for 10x. All right, so let's talk about the pathology. Now for the pathology, we've split it up between our trichomonas vaginalis and the gallinae because we're in two different locations, we're in two different hosts. All right, so for trichomonas vaginalis, most of the strains are asymptomatic. Most of the strains are asymptomatic. In males, almost all of them are asymptomatic. Almost all of them are asymptomatic. You do get the occasional irritation, so urethritis or prostatitis, so inflammation of the urethra or the prostate, depending on what it is. That would be a somewhat occasional. That might be the first clue that something might be wrong. The other clue would be if that male is in a relationship uh, with a female and then the female gets it because you're much more likely to see some of this pathology on the female side of things. And they would be the ones that would, would seek out treatment and then once they get treated, doctor would say, hey, do you have a male counterpart sexually active or a female counterpart, I guess? Um, and they, they would say both get treated. And shared households, if you share towel, towels and stuff, uh, washcloths, they would also say, hey, everyone get treated. So on the male side of things, most usually it's asymptomatic. Females, though. They'll exhibit trichomoniasis. That would be our disease name uh, for trichomonas. It would also be trichomoniasis in the birds as well, uh, just the, the cause. All right, so what do you get for this? Well, you'll get increased inflammation with itching and copious white discharge, which is leukorrhea. You know, it's immune cells and everything. Uh, it's all, it's caused by, now this leukorrhea, the copious white discharge is caused by other things, uh, or by things other than trichomonas, but if you have trichomonas, you'll get this. The reason it happens is due to the irritation of this parasite in uh, the vagina. Right. You do have chronic infections. It could persist. And normally what happens is um, you get a bit of a memory response. So you'll have reduced symptoms. But then uh, during times when you might be stressed, all right, your immune system gets suppressed a little bit, and that could cause the occasional flare-up. There's not a huge amount of damage. You know, most of this is just irritation, discomfort, and then the psychological issues associated with having a parasite, then uh, any sort of physical damage. So, yeah, you can treat trichomonas, you can clear it, go back to normal, nothing's wrong. And that's different from, like, the other uh, flagellates that we've had, um, you know, specifically leishmania or trypanosoma. And those, that, those can leave lifelong scars. All right, ready? All right, for Galenae, yeah, we'll, we'll give some pictures of these. Uh, so this would be avian trichomoniasis. Uh, this is usually a disease of young birds. Uh, and the reason why is oftentimes if the young bird's going to get it, they'll end up dying from it. Whereas adults may have had a simple case and not really progressed anything uh, to, to any sort of significance. Uh, the virulence in our birds depends on uh, the strain of the parasite, so is it a high virulent strain, is it a low virulent strain, and also the susceptibility of that bird host. So 
Some birds don't seem like they're as susceptible, or if they get it, you don't ever progress to some of the major pathology. Pigeons are an example where they're susceptible and they could die from it. They could die, die from it. So if you have a mild case, it'll be basically asymptomatic. The only reason, the only way you would tell is if you caught, captured the bird and looked. Uh, and in some cases, you have to swab and try to culture that swab. Uh, in other cases, this will be rapidly fatal. The parasite replicates very quickly inside that host, so then that bird will die anywhere from 4 to 18 days post-infection. Very quick. All right, so what is it dying from? Well, it dies from, basically from the pathology that's associated with it. So this parasite will cause white or yellowish lesions to occur in the mouth, especially in the soft palate region. So these are two different stages. This is an earlier stage, this is a later stage. I can't remember how many days. This could be like a, a one day difference in this host. But you open it up and you can see what appears to be a whitish lesion and you end up having lesions that develop you know, in that soft palate. So there's your throat and you can imagine as it continues to enlarge, you have the possibility of this starting to block the throat, uh, pharynx, you know, ultimately blocking respiration and feeding and stuff. This is that necropsy of a bird that died. So they removed part of its jaw, so its right side, so you can see that it got major blockage caused by, by the lesions due to the parasite itself. So you're going to have increases in size and number of these lesions. It'll extend into the esophagus, the crop, and proventriculus. Could lead to blockage resulting in either emaciation, so you have inability to feed, so they can't feed on it, or asphyxiation, so they block the, block the trachea. So this is normally where you find it. Mouth esophagus. Mouth and esophagus. Pigeons are a special case. In pigeons, a parasite can become visceral. So we encountered visceral leishmaniasis. Where did that occur? Inside the body, in the organs and tissues. So then pigeons, this parasite can also extend into the liver and the GI tract. You get those lesions forming in those organs, ultimately leading to organ failure. Do we have it here? Oh yeah, we've got it here in the pigeon. How we have have slides, prepared slides. <coughs> Questions? All right. No questions. Just as I was coming up here, I thought, oh crud, I didn't do the amoeba. I couldn't, didn't think we would get to it. And then I checked the presentation and said, oh, we're, we're in Parabasalia. So it was pretty quick. Uh, but we're going to go through the amoeba. Um, there's only hello, 10 slides. Yeah, only 10 slides to go through. And the reason we're going to introduce the amoeba is this is going to be one of, the, one of the specimens we look at. So we're going to look at Giardia. We're going to look at trichomonas, and we're going to look at entamoeba. All right, so that's what we're going to look at today in the lab. Whoops. Whoa. Did I move some? I did. I think I moved the slide. All right. The amoeba. It's a supergroup, amoebazoa. It's like all of the amoeba are in here because the systematics are completely unresolved. This used to be the old phylum Sarcodina. Uh, in some places you would see Sarcomastigothera. Uh, but I think now people are considering that classification invalid. Just, again, because as we start 
going through uh, sequencing, it's just becoming a bigger mess than what it is. A lot of that classification scheme was based on what we could see in the light mi microscope. Uh, and that's because a lot of these share the same structures. You have the taxonomists start to group them together. Uh, but then with sequencing, you start saying uh, some of these that seem to be very closely related are actually not. So that's why we said systematics are all unresolved. Uh, for the most part, though, we're going to keep class and family classification. Because we, we have entomuic to look at. But we also have presentations <coughs> on the Galeria follower. And that matches what's in the older literature. All right, so the amoeba, the unresolved group, what are the traits that are shared by amoeba? Number one, locomotion. It is by a pseudopodia or something similar. Right, I know you, when you've had zoology, you've covered it. Basically an extension. You have this uh, extension of the cell go out, kind of flatten and grasp, you could say, how it happens, put down some mucus so it can hold on, and then it'll kind of contract and pull the amoeba together, or pseudopodia kind of, kind of moves along the length. Number two, the cristae and the mitochondria are tubular. That's if that parasite has the mitochondria. So that's different than what we normally have, right? So for us, when we think, when we've always thought of the mitochondria and the cristae, we thought of the cristae as being infoldings, right? Not so here. In the amoeba, uh, they're tubular. They could be branched as well. Not just, so they're not really infoldings. <clears throat> and then, even though we're amoeba, and we think of your classic amoeboid stage, flagellated stages could be present. And if they have them, usually they have a single flagella, but I think we're going to see one life cycle, uh, or one presentation where you'll actually see, I think it's two flagella on that life cycle stage. So, you know, predominant stage would, life stage would be the amoeboid form, and then other life cycle stages could have flagella on it. <coughs> Ready? All right, so we're going to look at the class Lobozea family Entamoebidae because we're really going to be looking at the genus Entamoeba. So species in this family are commensals uh, or parasites. Uh, they're in the digestive tract of arthropods and as well as vertebrates. This is Entamoeba histolytica. You've got our trophozoite stage, which would be your amoeboid form. Then you have your cyst stage, which would ultimately leave the host and serves as a stage that, that gets into that other host. All right, so in this genus, the endamoeba, we have a vesicular nucleus with a small endosome at or near the center. And we're going to see this. There's our nucleus. Our endosome is at or near the center. Around the edges, we have chromatin granules. So it gives this almost a bullseye shape, and you see this as a near bullseye shape. Some species have chromatin around the endosome as well, kind of like almost a double endosome. Diagnostic. If, if we if we look at them, that could be used as diagnostic, as well as you know how sharp an edge is it? Is it a very clear and sharp chromatid granules around that around the uh, nucleus, or is it kind of fuzzy? Uh, do we have like these spoke-like wheel spoke-like uh, chromatin granules extending from the endosome and, and so forth? But it's very obvious. We're going to see this, and it persists in our cysts. Our cyst stage as well. Uh, there are food vacuoles found throughout the cytoplasm. That's the same thing with, with the amoeba. Uh, I think you looked at paramecium. 
Um, I don't know if it was live paramecium or not. But you can see the food granules. Uh, for us, they're going to look at different shapes. We don't know what's inside of them. In Entamoeba, we have no mitochondria and no Golgi. All right, so is that really going to be processing proteins for uh, excretion? Uh, you're not going to be utilizing <laughs> oxidative phosphorylation or anything. All right, they're getting by with your basic glycolysis. The cysts, though, contain something called chromatid bars or chromatoid bodies. So they, these black things that you can see in here, they form from uh, crystalline helical bodies, basically containing the ribonucleoproteins from our trophozoite. So you basically, as your trophozoite, your, your, your amoeboid form, starts to condense into a cyst form, you're going to have condensation of these helical bodies to form these chromatoid bars. We can see them. All right, we can see these bars. Uh, we might not see three or four of them, but you'll be able to see you'll be able to see them if we can find a cyst on our slide. Again, these are going to be fairly small. The amoeba, the amoeba, you can see them at about 40x, but you really need to, to go up to 100x to really take a look at them. And it's not like looking at our worms where you can see the worm on a slide. You have to kind of target the center of the slide and make sure we're in the correct focal plane to identify these. Uh, as these things, as the cysts start to become older, those chromatoid bars start to disappear. So uh, we'll see some. We'll make sure we see some. Ready? Yeah, I did. Where does this come from? All right, hold on here. Where are we? I'm going to reopen this. Don't save, because I think I, I did something. Because I don't even see that slide on the presentation. Yeah. There are a bunch of... That was when we had to go online. COVID struck. All right. So we're going to talk about Entamoeba histolytica. And you could do searches for this, and you're going to find loads of pictures. This is a causative agent of amoebic dysentery. All right. I say it's a scourge of players of Oregon Trail. I don't know if you've ever played it. I know you can play it online. They brought it back. But this is old school games that, like, one of the first games that, that I remember in school, where you have, like, a computer, and the only thing you could do is, like, write a program that says, hello world, and then the other, you have one of these secret games, but, uh, yeah, you would always, yeah, Carolina has dysentery, and you would die because you get amoebic dysentery, uh, but that's what it is, entamoeba histolytica. So, Let's go over the life cycle. This life cycle isn't terribly bad. It is a direct life cycle, but it has these different life cycle stages. So let's go ahead and get them up here. So transmission is fecal oral. Uh, our host is going to secrete these cysts that then will be accidentally consumed. Grab my chalk. So ooh, there's my piece of chalk. What we're going to do is start in our human with the trophozoite stage.
This is also one that I believe was uh, observed back in 16, 17, 1800s after the uh, microscope came out. So we'll have our trophozoa. That's our amoeboid form. All right. They reside in the crypts of the large intestine. They're going to reside in the crypts of the large intestine. Very specific location for them. These guys are going to replicate by binary fission. And they will stay there in the crypts of the large intestine. All right. Some of them will leave the crypts of the large intestine and will start to travel to the <coughs> posterior part of the large intestine. And then, from that posterior part of the large intestine, that is where we have water up You have the water uptake, and that triggers the formation of a pre-cyst. And that triggers the formation of a pre-cyst. This pre-cyst is spherical with chromatoidal bars. That's our pre -cyst. And then, they lay down your cyst wall and you have a young cyst. Right, so the pre -cyst, first thing you're going to have to do is kind of become spherical and then the cyst wall is going to start to be uh, created. And then once you get that cyst wall, now we are a young cyst. Inside that young cyst, we will have some, uh, we will have a round of division take place. All right? And that gives us our regular cyst that now has two nuclei present. So we go from one nuclei, we get our cyst wall, that's our young cyst, we have division take place inside of that cyst, producing two nuclei. And then, this cyst will continue to divide them to produce what's called a metacyst. So our metacyst now has four nuclei present. So it's quadrinucleate. Which is a term you might encounter Quad, back to four, four nuclei are present. That's our metacyst. It's during these steps where our chromatoid bars gradually disappear. <coughs> Chromatoid bars gradually disappear. <coughs> this metacyst that leaves the host and its feces right, where we now have our environment. There's our host. There's a human. Now here. So we're out in the environment. Metasys then gets accidentally consumed. And we have our metasys in the small intestine.
four nuclei in this metasis. We get to the small intestine. So travel through the stomach, go to the small intestine, and it's getting all the signs to exist. So at this point, we will now exist and we will divide. And that produces a total of eight metacystic trophozoids. All right, these eight metacystic trophozoids are a smaller form of a regular trophozoite and they can't replicate until they get to the trips, to the crypts. And then once they get to the crypts of the large intestine, they will divide and into that larger trophozoite form that we would see. So in these guys, they don't replicate until they can find their way to the, to the crypts. And in here, they're not just in the lumen. They're, they're in basically the mucosal line. Right? They're, they're, they're in amongst the uh, microvilli and whatnot. All right, and that's our life cycle. <clears throat> One exception. Some of these guys will escape. Escape that large intestine. So they will penetrate out of the gut. And go to various tissues. In the host. Could be the liver, kidney, lungs, who knows. But our trophozoites penetrated out of that GI tract. They get to these other organs and they still remain as trophozoites where now they can replicate in those various tissues. And if you can imagine, we're going to start producing some pathology associated. Questions? Almost seems a little too easy until we start taking into account this different progression. So kind of a key thing here, it's not just trophozoite and then that it exists, gets out of the host and then gets back to the host and, and excess and everything. You have the division that takes place inside of that cyst to get to four nuclei. And then the very first thing that it's going to do is divide as soon as it gets out of its cyst to produce eight trophozoites. So instead of when you consume one cyst, you're ultimately going to have eight trophozoites. They have to find their way to the crypts before they start replicating. All right. Any questions? All right, let's talk about pathology. All right, transmissions, fecal, oral. I said that. It's usually consumption of uh, contaminated food or water, not washing hands and whatnot. The metacyst is the only stage that can survive outside of that host. It's got to be that four nuclei stage. Also noteworthy, that is only found in formed stools. So amoebic dysentery, we didn't really talk about what that is. What, what, what's the symptom of amoebic dysentery? Extremely watery diarrhea. Yeah, you don't have metacysts in that. All right, and that means those individuals, they're not infectious. So usually the ones that spread it are those that are asymptomatic because they're producing these fully formed stools. 
And why does it, is it fully formed? Or, you know, why is it only, uh, only in these fully formed stools? It's because of that water uptake. You have to have proper water uptake to trigger the precyst formation. And once we form that precyst, then it can divide to form your metacyst. Divide twice to get to your metacyst. And then again, yeah, we emphasize that metacystic tro trobozoids, they have to reach that mucosal lining of the crypts before they can replicate. They won't replicate if they don't get there. So if they don't ever find their way or if they get swept through, that's it. You didn't, I mean, you may have ingested the cyst, but none of them found their way to the crypts. You're not going to have this infection. So because of that, infection success really is dose dependent. If you consume, let's say, five of these metacysts, Chances are you won't you won't get infected with it, but if you infect a hundred cysts or if you ingest a hundred cysts, now there's a much better likelihood that a small number of these metastatic trophozoites can get to the crypts and start replication. You have to have that replication in order to establish that to establish the infection. Ready? Not too bad. All right, pathology. It is strain and host dependent. All right, strain and host dependent. Some strains are going to be much more severe than others. Some hosts are going to be more sensitive than others. Just kind of hard to predict which one which one you're going to you're going to do. But the overall pathology is really associated with the parasite's ability to get out of that large intestine. So it's going to hydrolyze the gut wall, the gut epithelium, to get into the bloodstream and travel throughout the body. All right, and really, I mean, yeah, amoebic dysentery is diarrhea. It's watery diarrhea. And you can get treated. I mean, it, it, your immune system might eventually clear it. But once this thing penetrates out, now you're dealing with a much more significant disease. So the disease would be entomebiasis, or amoebic dysentery. I think we have that. Anyways, we're down in the crypts. You're going to have hydrolysis leading to lesion formation. Ulcer formation. This will be the same thing that occurs inside uh, in the various tissues. So, first place you often see it is in the cecum, the appendix, and the upper colon. So, you've got your crypts there. You're going to have these lesions that will form. This allows the trophozoites to, to move out and get into the circulatory system. All right. The parasite the lesion uh, increases as well. So, you're having more replication. Uh, and that's just going to produce more destruction of that mucosal lining. So you'll get lateral spread. Uh, if you think about your cutaneous leishmaniasis, where you have that lesion, that lesion can expand because the parasites replicate. Same thing here, same idea here. So it's the lesions and ulcers. Get the more of the symptoms. Yeah, the cause, it's your, this lesion formation, destruction of epithelium, and then destruction of some of the tissues. Here's a good image. Your chromatoidal bar right there. Your nucleus. Ready? All right, so the lesions resulting inflammation leads to your symptoms of amoebic dysentery, explosive diarrhea, bouts of abdominal pain, dehydration, loss of blood, potential death from gut perforation or from cardiac failure and exhaustion. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, this is really the dehydration is, is bad. I mean, you, you're going through all of this stuff, people just don't want don't to drink, drink, they don't want to eat. <coughs> But gut perforation is pretty bad because, again, now you're letting bacteria in the gut to get into the body. Your body's 
starts going into sepsis, uh, organs start to shut down and everything could lead to death. All right. uh, as part of our life cycle, as we said, when you have these loose or partially formed stools, when you're having this diarrhea, uh, you can find the trophozoites, pre-cysts, and cysts. You're not likely to find those metacysts in the stools. So that's why with our, our slides, most if not all of the cysts that we find will have chromatoidal bars, or they don't if they're circular with a single nucleus because that would be a pre-cyst. It hasn't formed the young cyst yet. But you'll find those in partially formed stools because you haven't, one, you haven't had the time for these cysts to, to completely encapsulate and divide, and number two, you've had delays in their formation because it, the trigger is that water up there. That's what's triggering your cyst formation. So that was part of our life cycle. This would be a metacyst. Uh, I believe this is actually on one of our slides. Uh, we're in the top focal plane. You can make out our two nuclei. There's no chromatoidal bars in it. If we focus down, there's another pair that's offset. So the second pair of nuclei are down, down there. So if we get to a different focal plane, we can see it. Not the greatest image, but it was, it is what it is. We're at 100x. And then I blew it up so we could actually see it a little bit better. All right. So gut perforation leads to ectopic lesions, so lesions in other organs. Uh, and here's where you get some specifics. So you have hepatic amoebiasis, you have pulmonary amoebiasis, um, and this is just you know specific terms for amoeba infection. So hepatic amoebiasis, formation of abscesses in the liver, because you're, those amoeba are feeding. They're, called, they're hydrolyzing tissue because they, they're getting the, the contents of those cells. You have pulmonary amoebiasis, again, abscesses that are forming in the lung. Uh, this usually ruptures, so this develops. So oftentimes we start down in the liver, kidney, spleen region, all right, because we get out of the gut and those are the first things that we encounter. If we get the pulmonary amoebiasis, oftentimes it's due to the lesions in the uh, liver that'll rupture, cause some hydrolysis of your diaphragm, and then they, they move up to the uh, up to the lung. And it's noteworthy, again, just based on its life cycle, this last part. Once they get out, they're not forming pre-cysts anymore. They can't. You don't have that water uptake that's the trigger. So once it goes outside of the gut, that's it, it's just the amoeboid form. That's all we would find in these areas. We didn't even, even mention like secondary infection, bacterial invasion of those lesions, but that's all possible. So that actually wraps up the amoeba. It's the only one we're talking, we're gonna look at. Uh, we have slides. Uh, the slides, I think, are cysts and trophozoites. Uh, and even in the trophozoites, we'll see some of the cysts. We'll see some of the pre-cysts and those young cysts uh, inside of them. So uh, we've got some slides to look at. All right, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start the AB complexins. We're going to introduce the AB complexins, and then I think on Monday we're going to dissect some uh, night crawlers. Look at some monocystis. All right.